Welcome to Healing in a Conflict, Module 7, where we're going to go through the 1248 of Healing in a Conflict, check out what sort of questions there might be, and then move into some micro skills to do with how to help couples navigate conflict in a way that minimizes escalation, which is their way of limit setting from an adult to adult point of view, and then showing couples, parents, how to set and enforce limits with their children in a way that's both effective and sensitive similarly without the usual es escalations. So uh, just to recap with healing in a conflict, so look at that there is one being and every signal is part of it. So that there's that constant thinking that everything that's going on is going on within this individual and this individual is part of one huge evolution and that the signals that you're seeing as disturbing as they might be are actually part of a process something that's coming from somewhere and actually trying to move the person to their next best moment of evolution so to think in terms of all of the signals are all part of the process, not apart from the process. That there are two realities, external molecular reality, five senses, touch, taste, etc., and the internal consequential reality, which is the reality that we mostly deal with that's extremely consequential the thoughts, the feelings, that which goes on internally that is the impulse for what ends up being behaviors that end up external and often end up disturbing in people's lives. And we start from the internal. Later on the session, we're gonna work with some micro skills that are very much external micro skills, helping people with their behaviors but keeping it very much in mind that that's part of the one person, being, which means that we're not expecting that because they're going to learn some skills on how to set and enforce limits within their relationship and how to set and enforce limits with their children or those in their care, that all of a sudden reading a piece of paper is miraculously going to make that change. There'll be a logical, rational mind expectation that, all right, well, now I understand this, I'll be able to do that. We know that there's a reason why it hasn't happened yet and that actually these limit setting tools, whether it's the conflict navigation guy or how to set and enforce limits with children, is actually gonna be a diagnostic tool. It's gonna show the person or the couple what it is they're not able to do. Then we'll do inner work to help them with what it is that gets triggered that stops them be from being able to deal with what's going on neutrally. And that of course is the healing trying to happen. The triggered response, the disturbance, that's actually not something going wrong, it's something trying to go right. Disturbing the individual or the relationship to the point that they seek help in order to see what is it that has happened that's led to that disturbance, what's trying to happen in the way of beginning to understand how they might be able to continue without the triggered response by doing the healing from finding out where that comes from because they're not acting in a present moment adult way. And that's where the four mechanisms come in We've gone through child, adolescent, adult, and self-distraction mechanisms. We'll go through that a little bit more in detail. 
but it's those mechanisms that are going to be what makes it difficult for the individuals and the couples to actually work with the conflict navigation guide and the setting limits with children template because what they were trained with is going to trigger them and they're going to want to be able to set and enforce limits in a neutral way but they're going to get triggered and they're going to raise their voice they're going to do things they're going to not be able to do or say what they said they would and that's going to be the work for internal healing that we'll use the cards for and of course that takes us to the floor cards which we'll work more in detail with later on once we've been through these micro skills just before we do that i just want to see if there's any questions um, and for those of you watching the master class by some medium you can use what's available to you in the way of emails in order to do that we're going to do that here with the people who are involved and i'll repeat the question so that everybody can hear it does anybody have any questions yeah when you talk about signals what do you mean by signals yeah so i think that's in uh, one of the modules where basically anything is a signal that's noticeable so it's a very broad net um, so you could have someone who stares off who doesn't answer the question who starts to tap their foot and do this all of a sudden or start to put one foot on the other now any of these things could be well i've got an itchy nose but if it repeats itself and you notice every time that they're talking about certain something there's that or they're biting the inside of their lips or they're laughing at uh, something that's obviously not at all funny then that which is noticeable so it doesn't require you as a counselor to know what is or isn't a signal it just requires you to be looking for them and what you're looking for is matches and mis mismatches so if someone's laughing at something that's very tragic that's a mismatch presences and absences oh yeah well no i didn't have dad um so that's really nothing for me probably not because it's a huge absence and sensitivities and insensitivities oh yeah my, my whole family got uh, run over yesterday but oh, i'm all right and you can see this lack of sensitivity to what that would be for any infant child so you'd be looking at where does this come from and they're just three simple coat hangers and they each have heads and tails and it just helps you take whatever signal that you're noticing and help you put it into a category of which one is that is it a match is it a mismatch is it a presence is it an absence is it a sensitivity is it an insensitivity that then helps you as you do with the four mechanisms to get a very clear picture in a very short period of time because you've kind of got categories to put things in as opposed to just a general awareness a general listening so it's a very good question what are signals and you know we're going to practice them a lot as as we go through the modules in the practice module does that answer the question cool any others okay so let's move on to conflict navigation now this is i would say one of the pillars of how people struggle in relationships in families 
because for eons coming from caveman times through the Middle Ages, through World War I and II and everything since, all of the methods that we've been trained with in order to deal with conflict have been the opposite of effective and ideal and sensitive. So what we come to the party with is methodology that either is effective but insensitive, ineffective and insensitive, or ineffective and insensitive. So the, the way you want to begin to look at how to deal with conflict is to go, is it effective, is it sensitive? Because that's the bullseye, where it's effective and sensitive. But you've got to remember that for most of us, what we're brought up with is a combination of ineffective and insensitive so that you can see that this is not something going wrong for the person that they're not being effective or that they're not being sensitive. So you want to begin with the premise that this is very normal relative to how we were trained, but normal doesn't mean healthy, ideal, effective. So to make this distinction. Um, and so these are micro skills and we'll start to use the conflict navigation guide because this is what you're going to sit down with with couples and get them to be able to have a template for how do we do this. So I'm going to get the conflict navigation guide. So almost all uh, issues that couples are bringing boil down to, to a large degree, not all, all the time, but to a large degree, their ability to navigate conflict. So the amount of relationships, which I've noticed over 40 years, end up getting to the point where there's, there's nothing left is almost always because they're unable to navigate conflict. And while the subject matter that um, people bring with them is, well, he's this, she's that, which might be to do with tidiness, which might be to do with intimacy, which might be to do with the children, which we'll talk about later with the other micro skill to do with limit setting. The actual issue is their inability to navigate conflict. So the starting point, literally the ability to put the finger on the pulse and go, okay, where are things at, is to go, how's your ability to navigate the conflict? And for most people, it's nil or worse than nil, that before they've almost done anything, things have already escalated, and before they know it, they're in World War III, and they've even forgotten what it was that was the reason that they were having a conflict in the first place. What was it about? So what you do is, while they're not triggered in the office, I often sit in between them so that they can see this both or in front of them. And we go through each of these things. This was uh, adapted from Michael Paymar's negotiation guide in Violent No More, um, which was uh, a book that used, used effective ways to deal with um, domestic violence. But I noticed that this is true with all couples. Um, and there are just very subtle ways that we do insensitive things. And then there's right at the other end of the continuum where things get extreme and it gets in the arena of, of domestic violence. But ultimately, what you're looking at is the need to be able to talk about whatever it is that's disturbing in a way that doesn't escalate. Now, by the time you will have been taking a couple through this, they will already know about the four mechanisms and that it's very normal that because they were trained in a particular way, they're gonna have a predisposition to either do one, two, three, or four, usually one, two, or three, 
in terms of how they deal with each other. Child mechanism, of course, would be where there's internal criticism, and so one of them doesn't say what they want to say. Adolescent mechanism is where one's acting out, shouting, screaming, as a way to get some level of compliance, albeit ineffectively and insensitively. And there's also a lot of adult mechanism, which is the override of adolescent mechanism, where one of them is wanting to say, well, I'm really pissed off about this, but their training is, no, you're not allowed to rock the boat. So it ends up as a lot of passive aggression. Usually, not during, <laughs> there'll be fourth mechanism self-distraction later on. After the argument, they'll drink, they'll smoke, they'll watch telly, they'll do whatever they need to do to just calm what's going on. So you're not bringing this as, well, if you were good, you'd be doing this. You're bringing, look, this is going to show you what you're unable to do. So starting off with that this is to be agreed upon beforehand and pointed out to whoever forgets by simply labeling in a neutral tone. For example, that sarcasm. So they're going to sit down and agree to all of this when they're not triggered. So you're starting off with, regardless of how strongly I disagree, or how angry or how hurt I feel. So that is a thousand percent permission for the person to have whatever feelings and opinions they're having. And that they will refrain from, they're going to do what they can and attempt to, which is what you're getting agreement for when they're not triggered, which is put down name-calling, sarcasm, or belittling. Now, with any of these things, these people have often been together a while, sometimes a year, sometimes 10, sometimes 20, sometimes 40, which means that they can very easily make a list of exactly what the other person does. They might not be able to make a list of what they do, but they'll definitely be able to make a list of what the other person does. And between those two lists, you want to add to this so that it's clear what it is that each of them are doing. Secondly, uh, I will refrain from using my voice or body in an intimidating manner, for example, yelling, pointing, and they add their list of what they know the other person does. And the most important thing about that is for them to be able to label it. And labeling is very specific. It's not, well, you're so disrespectful or you're so mean, which doesn't tell you at all what the behavior is. So you want to get clear, oh, you're so disrespectful, what does that mean? Well, you sneer at me. Or you badmouth my family, like the specifics, so that you can go, that's badmouthing. So that the person themselves knows that, yes, that's what it is, so that you're using the same language because the person has to know what the label is so that the label can be put in neutrally. And that's a skill. So what you're helping them do is find the labels that work. I will refrain from threatening in any way, standing over and invading personal space. And that can be very individual in terms of what it is that a person experiences as threatening. Because for some people that can be a look, for some people that can be a proximity. So you just need to get clear what that is and be able to label it. I will refrain from blaming and shaming statements. I will refrain from bringing up past incidents to prove a point. Now that's a really tough one. Because most arguments are all about that. You did this in July 1974 and I've never... Which stops people from actually being able to work with exactly what's going on right now. 
And when the present moment is so full of the past and, and I know you're going to do it again, which is the future, there's almost no room in the present moment for what's actually going on now, any possible changes. So that's what you're maximizing, to just be working with this one. It doesn't matter how many times it's happened before, or how many times it might happen again, just this one. And it's very similar to working with one moment in time. Because that way you can catch one rabbit as opposed to trying to catch a thousand and catching none ever or very rarely. And I will refrain from using my feelings to manipulate or emotionally blackmail. And some people aren't aware of that at all. So you might need to help them understand. You know, it's the classic, you know, how many how many people does it, how many Jewish mothers did it take to change a light bulb? None. Don't you worry about me, dear. I'll just sit here in the dark. Just in terms of uh, how things can be a little bit manipulative without even being noticed necessarily. But usually the partner will know exactly what it is. And that's the explaining that goes on when they're not triggered with you helping them. Now, usually it's very easy for people to go, well, of course, yes, I wouldn't do any of those. And most people will actually look at them and go, hmm, well, this is going to be tricky because they know that they do this a lot. But by this stage, you will have told them about the four mechanisms and I have some sense of that at some point in time, they're going to be able to work with that. They're going to be able to deal with what happens when they get triggered because they know it's not how they want their body to be responding, but when they get triggered, the child parts takes over the body and has them doing the most insensitive things to the person they love most on the planet. And of course, the part of the reason for that is that the people who trained them loved them the most on the planet, but the methods they were using were insensitive and ineffective, which is why that's what pops out, because it was their normal in the training early dependent stage of childhood. Any questions so far before we move on to what, what we will be doing? Yes? Would you ever ask if there's anything else that needs to be Absolutely. Done? Yeah, yeah. So the question is, would you ask if there's anything else? Uh, it's a really important question because this is not at all definitive and the people usually know exactly what it is they want to be able to deal with the, their partner. So you want to, I always allow for that which is not necessarily known. You know, this is just a template for, you know, Joe Schmo. And as my six year old told me when she was six, everybody's different, daddy. So very much so. Um, any other questions? Yeah, perhaps not a question, but a a thought or maybe it will turn into a question so it's just with clients that are um, unaware or that just for example more to the using feelings to manipulate or you know emotionally blackmail that just comes from a unconscious mind really that becomes quite tricky while the other partner is quite aware of that how would you how would you address that by getting the partner who's aware of it to talk about it because they'll have examples of how many times their partner's done exactly that, but it won't necessarily have a label, which is the whole point of this, is to have a label of, oh, you see that? That's emotionally blackmailing. That's manipulative. Whereas the person goes, well, I'm just being me. In the same way that while you guys might go, what's well, very clear um, what threatening is or what invading personal space is, you'll have all sorts of cultural groups who go, what are you talking about? This is how I, this is how close I stand to people. And you're going to have to do exactly the same of going, well, here are these two people and this person is saying that's too close, which is why you're navigating conflict. And then it's a matter of being able to have the label that's instead of F off, that just neutrally says you're standing too close which is the label, as opposed to the usual F off, 
will screw you and then before you know it whatever the actual subject matter of the conflict wants out the window so this is showing them how to label because then we're going to be doing more of that stop or I'm leaving which is stop using blaming statements or I'm finishing ending this will come back when you're not doing it so that it's not a matter of being perfect it's a matter of being able to label get out of harm's way set a limit and enforce it with the caveat with the exception that says and when you're ready to come back without using that method we'll continue the navigation it's not well that's it you've done that so i'm now leaving and slamming the door and that's the end it's an absolute work in progress does that answer it any anything else Well, uh, I, I'm going to suggest that that's going to be the case in almost every couple you work with, to some degree or not. In other words, the reason that you're even starting this is because they will have tried to label stuff, to deal with stuff and not be able to. One of the methods to deal with that, which I use a lot, is to actually get the couple to have a conflict. They each come up with one uh, conflict that they want to deal with, and then they do one first and the, the other one second. So one of them, you, you'll just start with, you know, you can toss a coin as to who starts first, but you show get them to have the conflict now they're doing it with you as a mediator but you're doing it to show them what it is that they do and don't do that's either not effective or not sensitive in order to kind of answer that question that's to do with either well i don't get it i don't see it i wouldn't call it that so that you can actually do things in real time while they're in the 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 office actually slowing them down whereby they're having the conflict but you're the ref and you organize that at the beginning that you have the right to come in with a red card yellow card that just says time out can you see that uh, you, you started to raise your voice then can you see that you didn't uh, set a limit there can you see that this is name calling can you see that this is you not this is bringing up past incidents. So you would get the same ha thing happening around what's being described as denial, which is not denial. It's a person not being able to notice their own signals, which is almost everybody who's going to walk in the door. Our job is to help them understand them, notice them, and not see them as something going wrong, which is the whole, oh, well, you're in denial it's what's your relationship to this because ultimately you could have two people who go at each other all the time really loud in each other's space and they're never coming into counseling because that's not a problem for them and they're both what might be called in denial but that's their relationship so the only things we're dealing with is where someone is going well actually this doesn't work for me that's the moment that you're going to pause at and go, well, okay, what's your language for this? And it doesn't matter whether it's zhupi that's my name for it. As long as the other person understands when you're doing zhupi boopi boopi, that's when I'm going to go stop doing zhupi boopi boopi or I'm leaving. And it really doesn't matter. All that matters is that the other person knows what it is. And for most people, that's going to be after a year or 10 or 20 or 30, whereby they know exactly what it is. All you're helping them do is label it. Then it's teaching the person who's doing the labeling to label in a neutral way. It's not going, you the joopy poopy poopy again. Which, of course, 
It's not going to be effective and it's not going to be sensitive, which is why we're coming back to this. Not expecting them to be able to do it, expecting it to be a diagnostic tool to put a finger on the pulse of, oh yeah, I'm not able to do that. Logically, when I'm in the office with you, yes, I'm agreeing to it. Then I get triggered and that Elvis has left the building. Then you've got engagement where the person's going, well, can you, can you teach me how not to get triggered? Because I can see that that's what needs to happen. And I'm not able to do it. Can you see the level of engagement you get there? Because they're, they're noticing it from their own experience, from what it is that they said, yeah, I agreed to that, and then I couldn't do it. That's real engagement. Because they're not going to do it because you think it's a good idea for them to. Okay? Any other questions? They're good questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, when you're working with the, each one come up with one complex, how do you navigate through if one person's saying, well, this happened and you said this, and then they go, well, no, I didn't, I said this. And then it comes into, you said this, I said this, rather than actually being able to really understand what the behavior was, rather than just, you said, I said. Okay. Yeah, this is going to happen all the time. Yeah. And that's kind of... Uh, where you start from. So what's true and real in the moment, which is why it's so useful to do it in real time, is that first of all, when they're talking about uh, you said, can you hear that that's already bringing up past incidents? And so you can help them come to the present moment of what's the issue that I want to deal with here. And that's why if you've got in your head this sense of working in the present moment and not bringing up past incidences. So let's say mm, someone went out and didn't say that they weren't coming home till late. Now, it sounds like last week, doesn't it? That's what we want to deal with. Well, it's today now, which means that's a past incident. So what's the issue? Well, I want to know that if you're going to be coming home late, I want to get a response to that. And then whatever it is that the person is going to say about that, which might be, I don't want to have to, or it might be, well, yeah, I'm willing to, I just forgot last time. Or it could be anything else. Then you're going to have to deal with the person who's going, well, I don't know whether you're going to do it. And all of the things that you're going to use your own micro skills for around how do you deal with where people break their word, where people say they'll do something and don't, and the whole trust issue, and how you can put things in place in terms of, well, this is a known quantity. So what's going to happen? What's the consequence if, if you do this again, where you'd be helping them go, well, okay, given that this has already happened, you can have things like, well, in order to go out next time, you have to put $200 in a jar that's already there. And if you call, you get your $200 back. But if you don't call, I get the $200. So there's a very clear consequence known ahead of time that the person's already agreed on that says, Okay, I haven't been so um, reliable up until now, but I'm saying I'm going to be. But you put a tangible something. And it doesn't need to be money. It can be, well, then I'll cook for the next week or whatever it is that they both agree on, but not just something that doesn't have any consequence. Does that answer the, the question? So, moving on to the things I will do. Yeah? I will remain respectful. Now, can you hear that respectful is very much one of those umbrella words that means a whole lot of different things to a whole lot of different people? So once again, as we've set up here, you want to define what that would be within the framework of the couple that you're working with. So it may be that remaining respectful is not doing all of the above. 
but you'd need to get their agreement on that. It might be that remaining respectful, which is often the case, is uh, can you talk in a civil tone? Can you talk in a friendly tone? These are kind of tried and trues because everybody seems to know what a friendly tone is and they certainly know when they're not using one. Sometimes they need a bit of help with that, but it's as close as we can get. You can just check it out with the people because uh, the strong opinions that people have when they come in as a couple, a lot of it's very much to do with the, the disrespectful, but you need to get them to label it, to go, well, what is it that this person does that's disrespectful? And then you'll get their version of what's the behavior. And that's work. That's our work is to take it from the big end of the funnel to the little end of the funnel. The big end of the funnel, oh, that's disrespectful or that's mean. The little end of the funnel is that's bad mouthing my family. That's name calling. Can you hear the difference? One's very general and you don't know what the behavior is. The other one is very clear and you know it when you're seeing it. Yeah? I will. Listen and let you finish. This is such a big one. So it's really important to have a pen and paper or an iPhone or whatever it is that you do or an Android. We've got a cockatoo come to say hello. What a good port end. Would you like to learn about healing in a conflict? <laughs> no, I would just like some seeds. Um, so not interrupting is a huge one and uh, depends on what the culture is, but regardless of the culture, you need to have a thing that says the person gets to finish what they want to say. The, the need to write things down is so the person can't say, oh, well, I had to interrupt because I was gonna forget. You make sure that people have pen and paper so that there isn't that sense of forgetting. And one of the other things that you can use with that is getting people to begin as their usual to actually have a phrase that says, have you finished? Really important, really simple. Have you finished? Okay. I will commit to working towards a mutually satisfying solution. Another big one, because people have a tendency to just want their own way. So when they're sitting with you, they're likely to go, oh yeah, I can see it would be useful to have a work towards a mutually satisfying, something that maybe is not what either of the couple likes or wants, but that is something they can agree on. And this will be the same with how we do limit setting with children is, yeah, I'm not happy with that, but I can live with it. Because you've got to find what each of these people can live with. That's not just, oh, well, you get your way and then there's a lot of passive aggression on the other side. I will apologize and or make amends for mistakes that I have made. Also can be a very tricky one. Very difficult for some people to do that because they were brought up with never surrender. Um, and, you know, people are likely to go, yes, yes, I'll agree to that until it actually comes to that and then they're not able to do it and that's what you end up working with internally because it'll be something that's triggering for them. Uh, I will be honest, like remain respectful. You're going to have to define that in terms of levels of honesty. And especially when a couple's doing work with a counsellor, they're learning so much about themselves in a very short period of time that what was honest before they started is often not honest two or three weeks in because they've changed so much and they're aware of what's going on and how they don't tell the whole truth. So that just has to be clarified. And I will, this is very important, 
respect the need to temporarily end the discussion. Notice the word temporarily. In other words, there's no walking out. There's no end to this. There's just temporary pauses. Why? Because one or both of the couple might be getting overwhelmed, might be getting triggered, might be using an insensitive method. And there has to be this sense of being able to engage and disengage. So this is the stop around leaving, being able to get out of harm's way when triggering's happening, which is all the stuff that we're trained as kids to do the opposite of. Because we're dependent on our parents, we stay and we can't go anywhere. And so that ends up happening in a conflict context. And so you want to get the person to notice that and be able to work that in an adult way as opposed to a child way. If I, if I need to end the discussion, then I will let you know the reasons why. And I will indicate my long-term willingness by making a time that is mutually convenient for the continuation. So if you're the one going, this is all too much, I need to, I need to stop for a moment, or a minute, or 20, or start again tomorrow, then I'm the one that says, I'll reconvene the meeting. Let's make it for 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. Let's make it in 10 minutes time, okay? If it is you that needs to end the discussion, I will give you space knowing that it is a necessary yet temporary pause. So we've looked at how to navigate conflict and set limits to some degree between adult to adult. Now, the thing with adult to adult is uh, they don't have a guidance role with one another. And what we're about to start to look at is where parents or caregivers have a guidance role with their children or those in their care. So the key issues are similarly about finding ways to navigate things without the usual escalations. So we're lo looking at neutral means of enforcement. So the stop or I'm leaving with labeling so stop raising your voice or I'm leaving, or can you talk in a friendly tone or I'm leaving. Ways that people can label neutrally in order to be able to get the result without the ineffective and insensitive methodologies. So similarly, there are things that are able to be categorized that are helpful for this. Uh, which is why we have the pro forma of the four important aspects of limit setting and enforcement, which is clarity, setting, enforcing, and consistency. Do you want to do a... Do you want it closer? Yeah, that's good. You have the still? So these four important categories uh, require some level of explanation. For most children, their training when parents were using various forms of, mm, I'm going to call it intimidation aimed at gaining compliance, which could be anything from a look to a softball bat. What we're looking at is what's required in order to do that effectively and sensitively. And my experience is you need four things. The look or the softball bat is the method of enforcement. So what usually happens is that parents do one enforcement, maybe some setting, often a lot of setting, sometimes no enforcement. What's often the case is there's very little clarity. It's just 
don't be so disrespectful or as opposed to don't call me names or don't raise your voice to me and very little consistency. So what's required is all four, clarity, setting, enforcing and consistency. If you do all four of those, you're going to be getting results. So what you're doing is up leveling from whatever they're doing to all four. They might be doing all three, they might be doing two, they might be doing one, they might be doing none. But where you're getting to is all four. So that's the design frame that you want to have in your mind in terms of what you're looking for when you're starting off with someone who goes, well, I, you know, the kids are doing all this stuff and I'm not able to do anything about that. You want to be doing the finger on the pulse to say, okay, what are you doing? Because they will have been doing it for a while, which is why they're in your office, is because that hasn't netted the result that they're after. So the key to this is that it's not just a way to try to get kids to do what they're told. It's actually becoming more loving more often, which means having effective limits that are clear, set, enforced, and consistent. And remembering the developmental stage of the child, which means things are likely to be different for a four-year-old as they are for a 14-year-old. And your role as a neutral, big letters for the word neutral referee, enforcing third-party consequence, consequences. Third-party consequences means not you and don't make me angry, which of course kids love to do. If, you, if they can have control over your feelings, they're going, where do I start? And of course, lovingly, to the degree that you're able. So let's start with the clarity. The clarity begins with what the behavior is. Now, uh, in any family situation, for the child, you want to have two of these. One is for just a day-to-day -day routine. In other words, from waking up to getting to school and from coming home from school to bed. Because what happens is so many parents just literally reinvent the wheel every day with these things. And there isn't just clarity about what needs to happen by what time so that the kid knows and the parent is setting that and enforcing that consistently. Now, very important right from the start to similarly situate the very reasons that the parents are having difficulty enforcing consistently with the children in a context whereby the chances are their parents did not do anything resembling consistency and did not do anything resembling clarity. Most parenting of the day was very ad hoc. In the moment, the parent goes, sweetie darling, please don't do that. And then eventually it's just bang, okay, that's it. And then they're in an adolescent mechanism, they're acting out, it's intimidating, the kid's frightened into compliance. And so that's what ends up happening when that kid becomes the parent because that's what's in their toolbox that they didn't choose. So to put all of this, not in terms of good parent, bad parent, but just what was your normal? What's gonna be there in your back room when you go to do it later on? Remembering that everything is not press the button, ring the bell, because you've got a shop front and a back room. So often you'll have parents who they don't want to do what was done to them, to their kids, so they're very, oh, well, we won't enforce anything. And until they're sleep deprived and they just lose the plot and then go, oh, I swore I'd never do that, which is what you're going to help them with the triggered moment. So similarly, this is going to be a diagnostic tool. This is not, oh, you should read this and become a perfect parent because you logically agree with it. No, it's just going to show you what you can't do. And that's then going to be the engagement for what inner work they're going to need to do in order to be able to enforce this neutrally, 
in a neutral tone, in a civil tone, in a friendly tone. And the way to do that is to have the third party consequence that is not, don't make me come down there. That's, well, either you're going to do this or this is what's going to happen. You know, well, you, you won't get to have Wi-Fi tonight or you won't get to watch your program or... Uh, and we'll talk about all the various things because th what parents have a lot of difficulty with is coming up with consequences that are clear and consistent and the third party consequences that's not, well, I'll shout at you louder or eventually I'll pick you up and take you somewhere. So um, we'll kind of go through this in quite a lot of detail because the parents are going to be the ones that are going to have the greatest level of difficulty being consistent. The kids, because they're more flexible, they tend to become pretty consistent pretty quickly. It's the parents that have difficulty with the consistency and you want to let them know ahead of time that that's what's going to be difficult for them so that they're not thinking there's something wrong with them. So that this is very much a diagnostic tool that you're just going to see what they're able to do and not able to do and then you're going to help them with the bits they're not able to do. Can you see that that's what I mean by holistic? There isn't anything that's not part of the process. Um, you also want to take into consideration but by the time someone's coming into your office, usually the wheels are either nearly off or completely off or were completely off years ago, in which case the state that the person's in is not believing in anything. They're gonna, that nothing works. Um, and you want to just feel that and go, well, it's possible that this won't work either, but let's wait and see. So that you're not saying, oh, well, just because I've had a lot of good experience with this, that it'll work for you. You're just saying, try it and see. Um, so let's start with, uh, and I might use the board for this, um, how to fill this in um, because in doing it in actual time will help clarify what clarity is, what setting is, what enforcing is, and what consistency is. Okay. So we're going to start to fill in the setting and enforcing clearly and consistently blank. Just before we do that, I just want to see if there's any questions in a general way about, before we go into the specifics. So are we looking at the child's behaviour or the parent's behaviour? We're looking at both. So in terms of are we looking at the child's behaviour or the parent's behaviour, it's mainly to do with the child's behaviour. However, there is also one whole form, which is just for each of the parents which is if they don't set and enforce the limits neutrally. So the child then has a right to go to give them a reminder. This is all organized ahead of time, which would be, mummy, you're not enforcing this limit in a neutral way. You know, can you say that in a friendly tone or in a civil tone? or you'll have to go to your room. Now, for most parents, it's like, oh, yes. <laughs> but it's that sense of that it's a flat hierarchy, that, yes, the parent has a guidance role with the child, but that doesn't give them the right to use insensitive methods or intimidation as a means of doing that, which is why the third-party consequences are so important. Um, however, the children don't have a guidance role on the parents when it comes to all sorts of other things. So this is just to do with A, daily routine, and B, specific behaviours that the parents want to work on, which I would suggest initially would be one, maybe two, three as a maximum, because you want to kind of chase after one rabbit and get one rabbit. And if you're changing the dynamics of the household and the way that uh, things are being dealt with, you want to start with small and then refine later on once you've got some runs on the board, particularly A, from the parent's point of view and also for what the child, the child can deal with or children can deal with. 
But what I can say is from having used this in some of the Harlems of Sydney, um, Claymore, Shelby, um, this can turn a family around in a matter of two weeks. It doesn't always happen in two weeks, but the difference is chalk and cheese when the parent knows what to do, how to do it, has agreed with themselves or their partner to do that for eight weeks, no matter what, and that the children see that and notice that. And the difference between the first week and the second week, where they start to see, oh, this is different and this is able to be possible because from the parents' point of view, they've got no model of it. So it's like foreign territory. So, uh, obviously, yes, this is, the first two is, is for the child and this one is for the parent. And all you're doing is making a distinction between literally, and you, we'll, we'll do it on this form, which is, uh, from waking to getting to school. Obviously weekend's gonna be different. And then from school, coming home from school to bed. So having clarity about what time each thing, what time, what thing. And, you know, uh, some parents already have that stuff clear on the fridge and stuff to do with, well, you need to be dressed by 7.30, finished breakfast by Eight, 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 eight a.m. in the car or bus or at the bus stop by eight thirty. Can you see what I mean about reinventing the wheel? You're just clarifying stuff so that it's clear both to the child and to the adult because for a lot of adults they never had that, so everything was just when I get prompted, when I get prompted. And so their parenting is when I prompt them, when I prompt them, and they're knackered. They're just exhausted by the time they get to here. And that's when they've been very nice up and then it's like they just go nuts because they didn't start here. And they're not using third party consequences. And obviously after school, it's, you know, play lunch or whatever you call it over here. Uh, out of bag by 4.30 and homework by whatever time and then you know there's usually dinner which could be at table by and then the whole bedtime routine teeth toilet and then story and lights out by <clears throat> whatever that might be 8 p.m. or whatever and can you see this is clarity now <clears throat> many people are going to go well I don't want to have my health like a military whatever it is and no one's talking about taking away democratic rights to change or do or be flexible with stuff. But you have to have a starting point, which is why I say to people, don't even start doing this unless you're committed to this for eight weeks. Because of course, there can be loads of exceptions to this, but if you don't have this structure in place, there's nothing to be flexible from. You're just reinventing the wheel every day and you're literally building a chair to sit in today that tomorrow is in pieces on the floor that you then build again as opposed to actually building a chair that's there every day and that's the chair and you're not building it each day. So is all that 
clear enough? So just going back to what you said before about just do one, two or three. Yeah, but this is, that's, that's so the that, second one. Oh, that's the second one. That's the second one. This is just the routine. Oh, okay. Okay, sorry. Mm -hmm. Then on top of this, the second one's going to be the behaviours, because often the people who are going to come in are not going to be coming in because of the daily routine. It's because the kid's screaming all the time or the kid's kicking their brother all the time or the kid's yeah. uh, not able to stop what they're doing in class or whatever it is. So yeah. there'll be a behaviour that, that's... But you, you want to start with this, okay. because, apart from anything else, because this is actually simpler. This is stuff that there's no question about, whereas often when the kid's doing a behavior, it's triggering whatever's in the back room of the parent. How old, what age would you do this up to? Depends on the family, but <laughs> I have, I have in-laws who are still living with their mother in their late fifties. So obviously there's a transition. And uh, so, so the question, which is at what, uh, what uh, up to what age would you use this? It depends on the situation. However, I'm often working with uh, what I would call <laughs> our version of failure to launch, where in, in Australia, adolescence can last a really long time. And so you've got parents who have a 25 year old still living at home but they haven't made the transition from child to housemate who happens to be living in my house, who happens to be my child, who's no longer a child. And the child hasn't made the transition and the parent hasn't made the transition. And so this stuff is just helping you make clear what that is. Now, obviously with an older, uh, mm, the parent on a certain level doesn't have a guidance role anymore. Like I'm going to suggest after 18, they don't have a guidance role anymore. In which case you'd be doing a different limit setting that's to do with what I can live with in my household and what needs to be clear and what the consequences are. Because most of them, and some of them at 30 and 35, are just going, well, he does all this stuff and he brings all of this drugs and stuff into my house and it's terrible, but I don't know what to do mainly because there isn't any sense of being able to set and enforce limits around their own personal space. And so they end up living in an existential hell because no one ever taught them that they can say, no, if you do this, this is what will happen. And eventually you won't get to be here. But for some parents, that's like a, it's not, not negotiable. In which case you have to work incrementally backwards. But We'll work more with that in the, in the second one. No, of course not. And that's what I meant at the bottom of the page here. You know, remember the developmental stage of the child, and this is stuff you can look up on Google. It's very known about now, but when, when most of us were growing up, no one even knew what the developmental stage was. This is what we're kind of catching up on, because we were all a generation before that. Children were just perceived as little adults who you had to break their will in order to, uh, you know, get some level of compliance, which is all the backroom stuff that we're dealing with today. Okay, so this is just the clarity side of things. Then you're starting to do the setting, which is the reminder. Now, obviously with younger kids, as many as you like, but I suggest to start off with maybe three, maybe two, depending on the parents. Some parents will go, no, I'm not giving them a three. I'm only giving them one. I was like, all right, but you might find that they don't do it so well initially. Because of course, later on, you can always get it, make it less. You can go from three to two, but initially you want them to win. And what those three would be is if it's 7.30, that you're reminding them at, at seven, 7.15 and 7.29. So that they get the opportunity. Because what you're doing is you're not disciplining them you're teaching them self-discipline. Big difference. They're having to think, which way do I want to go here? As opposed to, well, just when I'm terrified, that's what I do. Because then what happens is as soon as a, the parent isn't there and they're an adult, they don't know what to do, which is why things go very weird in adolescence, because there really isn't any sense of self-discipline. It's just, oh, well, they're not here. We can do whatever we like. Yes? 
So the three reminders is to get them to go, oh yeah, which way do I wanna go? And that's gonna happen because there's a consequence and this is the stuff that people find difficult. Sometimes they'll already have consequences that work and you'll just be adding to them and you want as many increments as possible so that let's start off with, um, okay, so it's nearly 7.30. If you're not dressed by 7.30, um, then maybe you don't get your favorite breakfast. You know, instead of getting eggs on toast, you get wheat bix or the, the, what the parent knows the kid's not so fussed on or you just get fruit. So that you're starting off with something that's not such a big deal, but that the kid has to go, yeah, which one do I want? But then it's, well, I don't care if I don't get my favorite brekkie. This usually happens as the child gets older. So you need backup consequences. Well, you see, if you don't do that and you don't get your favorite brekkie, it also means that when you get home, um, you don't get Wi-Fi or you don't get to watch the program that you usually like to watch when you come home. Or so there's, Wi-Fi, and this is a list that just goes on that just gets worse for the kid. So that at the end of this is, and eventually you don't get to be in the house. Now that's gonna be very challenging and triggering for a lot of people. But just remember that can be just, well, you, you're on the veranda. In other words, where the kid realizes that if they're not willing to cooperate in this way, then the parent isn't willing to cooperate with all of the stuff that they take for granted. And of course you have many, many increments before that, which might make go from, well, you don't get access to your room, which of course people, kids tend to take for, for granted. So you just put a little lock at the top thing that says, you know, well, you don't get your room. Or, you know, later in adolescence where it's like, yeah, I'm not doing this. And it's like, well, okay. Increments before that can be, well, you don't get to use your bed. You get a yoga mat and a sleeping bag. Or it can be that you don't get a cooked dinner. You get a sandwich. There was one family where it was like, she, the, the mother says to me, yeah, well, I'm not a terrible, I'm not a very good cook. My kids would actually opt for the sandwich. <laughs> But what you're doing is basically saying, look, it's up to you how far you want to go, but it's not going to get any better. It's only going to get worse and that's up to you. This is the one you'll have to work with the most. Yes. Oh, sorry. No, it's all right. So just having, having flashbacks now and yes. traumatized parents and things. Yes. Because I'm thinking about your front door, back door stuff. Yes. And as a kid, Having your safety removed is the is traumatic. What are you calling your safety? Well, if you're put on the veranda or told. Well, I'm thinking of an internal veranda. Yeah. No, I'm too. <laughs> my father did that to my to my one of my kids. Around. Yeah. Look, yeah, this is. Going you, outside, it was literally yes. safe veranda, and it was all fine. But I'm like, I don't feel good about that. Yes. Obviously, this is not something that I'm putting here. I'm just using examples from previous clients. Okay, this is for the parent in exactly the same way as we did with the conflict navigation guide of labeling where it has to be what each of those individuals label and know and understand. This is what the parent goes, yeah, I, I can live with that. So this is not something you're enforcing on them. You're saying to them, well, what do you want to use? Yeah, so I understand that, but if they chose to do that, so let's say we go, okay, we were good about the veranda. Yeah. From the child's world, could that be? Well, of course it could be. On but Sykes couch. Well, it, it, it could be, going, yeah. Oh, put me on the veranda. But, you know, how many kids are on the psych couch because of all of the horrendous ways that parents have done? So our job is not to second-guess the parent. I mean, there is horrendous parenting going on on the planet as we speak, and it's, it's, it's not our job to go, this is the right way or the wrong way. They're coming in and saying, can you help me do this? Given that you're saying, well, we want to do this effectively and sensitively, obviously that's within the bounds of whatever the parents call sensitive. 
So we kind of have to get off our own pot in order to go, well, this is where these people are, not be the local docs going, well, we don't think this is so fabulous. You actually have to go into that. You can have it on your shelf as, hmm, where did you get that from? Because, I mean, you're going to have parents who are going to come in and go, well, why can't I hit them? You're going to have to work with that. And you'll do it from the point of view of effectiveness and sensitivity, and you'll work with that framework of, well, where did you get that from? Where, when did that become your normal? And literally helping them work with, okay, so if I became three times my size, and I decided to get a strap or a judge cord and do this to you in my counseling office here, how might that be for you? And that often has people going, oh, I see but that they don't see initially, like the resistance. Do you find Does that answer the question? Um, and then there's what the incentive is. In other words, if they go, depending on what their usual is, let's say this never happens, then you'd go, if you go one day getting this stuff done, what do you get? And it's something that's repetitive that the parent can actually do on an ongoing basis. So you don't want it to be, well, I'll give them ten dollars and the parent can't afford ten dollars every day so usually it's well they get a a, a favorite dessert or they get extra story time or it might be money there you want to just go what is the usual amount paid and it doesn't matter whether it's a regular thing or not a regular thing it's simply, um, if let's say they get about $10 a week or $5 a week, make it seven and make it $1 a day and then chop these down into just percentages of that day, of that dollar. So that at the end of the day, they get, or even during, you know, here's your 20 cents for that. Here's your, so that you're always catching them out doing something right. So they actually get it because they're not abstract thinkers as children. So is that part clear? Mm. Yeah. I just, I just share that when um, so my daughter was seventeen, went through a lot of mental health issues, was having quite violent outbursts, and just seeing that like that, I'm like, that's. I started a star chart with her. With yes. The kids when they were little. Yes. And it totally worked. Yes. Because she was like, like, and you would think. Yes. She's 17, but she was like, Mom, I did a whole month. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, and you know, to be able to go, and each week to be able to yeah. see it. And, yes. Yeah. So, so it's that. And the star charts is about clarity yeah. and consistency. Yeah. You know, it's not, not so much to do with the setting and the enforcing. Yeah. But by the time they're getting the star, it's because the setting and enforcing is, is getting stars for. Do you follow? So it's just to say, yes, this stuff works. All this does is add to it from the point of view of when, when they're not getting the stars, because you have to have both. You have to have the incentive and you have to have consequences that actually work. And this is the key one, which it might not be not being able to be in the house, but whatever it is, that's the end, the bottom line for the parent. You follow? Which, and you have to work out what that is. You know, and for some people it's, well, you have to stay with grandma and it's not a holiday. You just get a room and you get your food and that's it. Or a friend or whoever it is so that they realize, no, this is not just taken for granted. You earn it by doing this stuff. Okay. So now let's go to behavior. And obviously you're going to do one of those each for each of the kids and eventually one each for whoever's caring for them for the neutral enforcement. So similarly, let's say the behavior is uh, shouting and it could be either at parent or at sibling. Now, there, you, you want to minimize the reminders. It's, it's once, once and you're out. Mm. So you get a reminder so that they get the opportunity to notice what am I doing? Because it's their normal. 
and it's literally the stopper I'm leaving, it's that's shouting, you're either going to stop or this is the consequence. Do you follow? So do we write? Well, it's whatever their consequence is going to be. No, you're or? putting the one that they're doing that you can label, shouting, voice raising, name calling, put down, kicking brother, yep. like only what a video camera would see. Yep. Now, because we talked about kicking brother, uh, I kind of make a distinction to do with uh, physical violence, even though there's all questions about that, that says no reminders. Because otherwise, if you have one reminder, then they always get one in. Whereas, if it happens, there's zero reminder, you're already into the consequence. Because th this is something that we, they will, you will have sat down, the parents will have sat down with the kids and go, look, I know this is how we've done things before, but this is what we're going to be doing from now, and it's going to be very hard for us to be consistent with it, very hard for you to do as well, but we want to do this because we don't want to be shouting at you, we don't want to be having these escalations, we want to be more loving more often that's the whole point and then you're going to do the same sort of stuff in terms of um, consequences and obviously yes there's going to be a huge difference between how you do this with a three-year-old and how you do this with a 13 year old and how you do this with a 23 year old really really different to do with the developmental stage and often you know here towards you know middle to late adolescence and beyond it's well you don't get to be here but you have lots of increments so they have to really go I want to use you as a doormat or else and you have to be able to go well go find another doormat and that stuff you probably have to help them with because they often don't have that ability to do it themselves which is their inner work clear enough just the difference between one or more reminders and zero reminders. Yes? Okay. So now we're going to go to the parents one. So this is their own form with the singular behavior, which is non-neutral setting or enforcing of this. In other words, where it's not, well, you've just shouted uh, so you'll have to go to your room if you don't stop. It's, you have shouting and I don't want you to shout. And where the kid needs the ability to go, well, you need to tell me that without shouting at me. Even though the kid's just shouted. Can you hear? Because what you're setting up is no one's doing shouting here. Doesn't matter whether you're older or younger, whether you've got a guidance role or not. Everybody deserves to be talked in a neutral tone, in a civil tone, in a friendly tone. So the singular one for the parent is hmm. let's uh, make sure Alice can see. Is not setting and or enforcing limits neutrally. And you want to help the kids to label the behavior, whether it's voice raising. And the reason I use voice raising is because it, it doesn't have all of the criticism that's tied up with shouting, yelling, screaming, because someone might go, well, I'm not screaming, but to someone it feels like screaming. Whereas if you say voice raising, everybody knows if it's not just talking normally. And you want to wear it on the chin that says, well, okay. And you want to come with your own that says, yes, if I do that, I'm willing to be sent to my room. No, you just have the wine in the little cabinet that no one sees. Um, so it's just something that says we're all willing to take on, take something on the chin that says, if I'm not doing neutral, you have the right. Because it's what you want for later on so that other people, adults, 
can't just do that to them and they go, oh, well, I guess that's how it is, which of course leads to so much relational abuse, sexual abuse, psychological abuse, because no one's told them no. It doesn't matter if someone's an adult or has a guidance role, that doesn't give them the right to treat you insensitively. Is this clear? So, any questions on that? Because that pretty much covers setting and enforcing clearly and consistently. And people, when you show them this, kind of go, oh, there'll be a list a mile long of why they think this won't work. Because that's been their experience. So you don't want to kind of take that as resistance. That's them saying, I've never seen it. That's not a planet I've ever lived on. And you want to go, yeah, I understand that. But I don't need to understand electricity to go over to a button on the wall and turn it on and go, oh, that's good. And you want to literally bring it like that. It says, just go over to the wall, press the button, see if it goes on. Get them to do it. See what happens. Yes? Question? So, you know, you're raising your voice at me, Mum, when they're like three. Yeah, I, look, this is what I mean about developmental stages. Uh, the parent's going to do this to the level that they're, they've got the awareness of it. And, you know, often parents are coming with like a three, a five and a seven year old. And they're having to kind of work that in terms of their sense of where the kid's at. Because it's not necessarily what Google says in terms of developmental stages. So it's, it's just relative to the parent and the child. And then taking into consideration that often there's two parents, whether they're same sex or otherwise, and that's where you need the conflict navigation guide for them to actually navigate what one would do as opposed to what the other would do and coming to a point of which is probably not what either of them like, but what they can agree on in order for it to be the same for the kid. Now that's ideal, but there's plenty of uh, situations where I'm only seeing the wife and the, and the father's not interested in this stuff at all, and you can still do it. Because children go from home, one set of rules, and go to a school, completely different set of rules, and they're fine. So all that happens is, this is mum's set of rules, and dad's not involved with that, so you're on your own with that. Doesn't mean you can't have the consistency from the parent who's wanting to give it. And this is often the case when you've got separated relationships, where, you might want consistency, and in a lot of modern separated couples, they'll both be willing to do the same thing at their house, and there'll be plenty where one's saying, nah, I wouldn't, I'm not even going to talk to you. And you can still do it, and the kid knows the difference between the households. And this is usually <laughs> the karma household. Does that answer that question? Cool. So. Just to finish off, this is a tool, this is a template. You're gonna have to work with who's in your room and their ability to engage with this in their way. So the last thing you wanna be doing is, is imposing it on them in some way, shape or form. You wanna be getting, what is it that they can do? And in some situations, it's gonna be one thing they're going to be able to do one thing and that'll be the thing that you help them with and don't worry about the fact that it seems small to you because for some people it's going to be huge. Okay.